Hey folks, and welcome to the Salty Seamans Bullshit Military Movie Reviews, aka Half Truths, Untruths, and Interesting Factoids, not to mention things they actually got right. Now right off the bat, I'm letting you know this is just a little something I'm trying to experiment here with my channel. Just having a little bit of fun with uh, movies with a military bend to them. You know, just having some fun pointing out some stuff that isn't right, and stuff that is right. Among some other is interesting facts about the military. Now, this might be a little bit of a rip-off, you could say, of, you know, Cinema Sins. Now, you could challenge me with that, but I could also say I'm also ripping off the Nostalgia Critic and the Cinema Snob and many others. Like a wise man once said, you rip off one person, it's plagiarism. You rip off many, it's research. Yes, the haircuts given to boot camp are not gentle. This is not a bunch of bullshit. This is really true. This was true back then, this is true now, this is true when I went through. They have a lot of people to get through, and they just kind of go around your head with a pair of clippers, and it hurts. Now, right off the bat, I want to say the uh, first half of this film, the boot camp part, is very accurate, especially for a movie. I know this, even though I'm not a Marine, or I never went, I definitely was not a drill instructor or a Marine during the 1960s. However, my father was a Marine DI in the 60s, and he cited this as the most accurate part of the movie, and I've heard it from other people. As opposed to the second half, well, we'll get to that. Racism. Yes, that kind of stuff did really happen back then. Not so much today. The violence, too. Yes, that was uh, a part of it. Also one of the things that is kind of dialed down. In fact, it's kind of non-existent at this time. Gomer Pyle is, of course, a reference to the character from the Andy Griffith Show and Gomer Pyle USMC. It's a spinoff show where Gomer Pyle joined the United States Marine Corps. Hence the nickname given this to the 60s is a very timely and accurate pop culture reference. Joker 2, not just being funny, but as a reference to the 1966 Batman show, where of course the Joker is a character. Now the nickname Cowboy here is pretty immortal. Anybody from Texas could probably get that at any point in time. Now the nickname Snowball here, unfortunately, is racist and hopefully not something that would ever be timeless. The guy marching in there is called The Guide. A little bit more on him later. Hazing, also still part of boot camp, and will always be part of boot camp, to different degrees. Here we have a rare glimpse of the other drill instructors, or DIs. Now, this is one of the major uh, overlooks of the movie, and about any movie about boot camp. The movies about boot camp tend to focus on one drill instructor, drill sergeant, what have you. And usually there's two or three. Here we see three, which is, I think, the traditional number of Marines. But being a movie, they they focused on one, that being the senior drill instructor, Mr. Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. Now, part of the reason for this, of course, is just it's easier to focus on one nasty drill instructor kind of prototype. Now, in this movie, of course, what kind of makes the entire boot camp scene here, another than the person playing uh, Leonard, a.k.a. Private Pyle, is... Of course, Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, played by Arlie Ermey. This was a breakout role for him. If you don't know the story behind this, uh, he was a person who left the Marine Corps. I said he was an actual uh, Marine vet and a former DI in the 60s. Uh, he left and he became the uh, proprietor of a brothel in Okinawa, Japan. And he decided to try his hand at Hollywood. He became a uh, military advisor for Hollywood movies and wanted to try his hand at acting. After doing a few movies as a military advisor, he came on to Stanley Kubrick's classic here, Full Metal Jacket, and decided he, well, he was going to take that uh, drill sergeant role for himself. And he did. He kept complaining the original actor hired from it was not doing the right job. So Stanley decided to audition him. The audition apparently included him talking like a drill instructor, hurling profanities for 15 minutes while people pelted fruit at him, and he did not repeat himself one time. And he got the job. And it made his career, and as his most iconic role, and one of the greatest roles in cinema history. So, the right move was made there. Now, this might be my modern-day person talking here, but I would imagine even in the 60s, pushing any kind of religion 
a period, even with all the racism and hitting, you know, the religious stuff maybe would have been a no go. So I'm kind of iffy about whether or not this is bullshit or not, even though it leads to a moment of realization that Joker is going to be a leader here. But I kind of think it's bullshit even for the 60s. Now, for the record, a squad is part of a platoon. This, what we're seeing right here, is a whole platoon. It's what they're called in boot camp. A squad is a part of a platoon, so him being made the squad leader... So, part of a Joker here being made a squad leader means he is a minor leader, but not the leader of the entire platoon. The, entire, the leader of the entire platoon is someone called the guide. That's the guy carrying the flag you see in all the uh, marching scenes. Uh, that is the biggest role a recruit can have. And from what I've heard from my Marine buddies, no one gives a shit that you were the guide in boot camp. So don't ever bring it up after you're done because you'll just be made fun of. Here we see him call him Leonard, which is a very specific moment of humanizing or trying to humanize your friends in boot camp. Because as a rule, we're usually going by last names, which kind of extends to the whole military, but especially in boot camp. You know, you only call other people by their first names and very private and once you become friends with them and this movie you also see they they take the more nickname approach which is fine uh, maybe a bit overdoing it here but for movie purposes it will allow it so very important scene here and uh, very very real now this one uh, I mean it's funny but uh, using the uh, various killers as examples of great marine shooters especially Lee Harvey Oswald who just killed the president a few years ago as you know why you know being a shooter in the marine is so great i kind of call bullshit i mean that that is really callous even for a drill instructor but uh that one's a little bit iffy this is a health inspection and yes these are very real i have more on how the donut got there later i'm sure some people will be wondering how did he get that donut there all the way from the mess hall but again we'll talk about it later now, the bigger question here is, this is about halfway through boot camp, and honestly, Pyle looks about the same size as he's always looked. Now, no, for movie shooting purposes, the actor kind of had to keep the same weight, depending on what scene they were shooting, but in reality, as a boot camp, someone that big going through Marine boot camp about halfway through would have dropped 20 pounds easily by now, or at least a fat. He would not still look essentially like a uh, the same fat body he did in the first scene, which he does throughout the entire uh, part of this movie. Now, here's a scene that's interesting that uh, kind of points out to me because people always say like, "Well, you know, the, the stresses of boot camp made Pyle snap." Uh, throughout the movie, we kind of see the look on his face. I don't think Pyle was ever there to, much to begin with. And here's an early here's kind of an early scene where we see, you know, the kid just doesn't look all there. He looks maybe slightly. Uh, you know, special needs, possibly. I mean, who knows? But uh, I, I think there was something with his facial expressions that we see the whole movie uh, Kubrick was trying to bring out. He didn't so much snap as he uh, was just driven to the point where someone like him would have gone anyway. This is what's called a blanket party. This is very accurate for the time. Uh, a lot more rare today. But yes, these did exist. Section 8 is a term for someone going nuts if you've never heard it. It's out of favor now, but in the back in the day, this was the term. Okay, now going back to the uh, donut scene, I'm going to tie this in here with the ammo. Here's a problem uh, anyone who's been through boot camp might know is, okay, we had saw earlier that they had their rifles were hanging off their uh, bunks. Now, or this is the last day before they ship out, why would their guns still be hanging there, number one? when they'd be locked up somewhere. And even if, say, somehow their, their rifles were still hanging there, the fact that he got up out of his bunk and picked up his rifle and made it all the way to the bathroom and picked up his ammo from wherever he got it without the Firewatch, a.k.a. Joker, catching him before now, seems a little weird. You really don't do much in boot camp at nighttime without, you know, a watch, you know, pretty much having eyeballs on you at all times. So that's a bit weird. Uh, the other question is on the ammo. You know, anyone say like if the ammo rain, the, when you're going to shoot your guns, they keep a pretty tight rein on your ammunition. It's not so. How did he manage to sneak it past? Well, I posit this is a bit of brilliance from Stanley Kubrick in the fact that uh, we saw earlier with the jelly donut, he managed to filch the jelly donut from the chow hall, 
keep it on his person, get it back into his footlocker uh, before he got caught with it. And he'd probably done that a few times before. It's just, that was just when he got caught. So it makes sense. If he was that good at it, maybe he's just one of those kids that's good with a five-finger discount. You know, snatching up ammo from the ammo range probably wasn't that hard for him. Officials, policemen, Arvin officers, school teachers. Roll credits. Oh, wait, that's not my gimmick. Never mind, moving on. I like that he put his cover on. It's a, a really good sign of, uh, you know, showing his authority. The, the, the drill instructor, the smoky bear, the drill instructor hat, is his authority. So even though he was in the middle of sleep and he's still in his undies, he had the wherewithal to go grab his hat. His cover. I like it. Now we get into the second half of the movie. Uh, this half is not quite as accurate as the first one in terms of pure military. I've heard this from, you know, much my father who served in Vietnam for our three tours and amongst a few other people who have, uh, who also served, but this is more of a stylized version, which you kind of expect from someone like Stanley Kubrick. He's more known for kind of bringing, uh, more of a cinematic style than, you know, absolute accuracy. Even though in the first part we did get that kind of accuracy. In this part, you know, you can kind of let it go depending on who you are. But personally, I do think this is the weaker half of the film. Me so hard, you keep lying. Me love you a long time. Q2 Live Crew. Stealing from a GI? Yes. In broad daylight? This is kind of bullshit. I hate the name, Joker. I want to go out into the field. I've been in country almost three months, and all I do is take handshake shots at award ceremonies. Here is an example of what we call Pogue Envy. A little bit about that later. Joker, I've told you we run two basic stories here. Grunts who give half their pay to buy gooks, toothbrushes, and deodorants. Winning of hearts and minds, okay? And combat action that results in a kill. Winning the war. Now, speaking as a former uh, military journalist, I can say this scene is bullshit. Uh, this is completely exposition to let the audience know that we are not uh, investigative journalists. We are, in fact, public relations for the military. The uh, public affairs officer here would not have to explain this to Sergeant Joker. Joker would absolutely know this because it's been beaten to his head since he went through training school, a uh, military journalism school. The hair on all these guys are just a bit long, even for the 60s and Marines in the field, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of bullshit. They would have kept it a bit shorter cropped. It's hard to talk about it, man. It's like on Hastings. Uh, you weren't on Operation Hastings payback. You weren't even in country. Eat shit and die, you fucking Spanish-American, you fucking pogue. Now here we have more pogue talk. If you don't know what pogue means, it's person other than grunt. That means anyone who's not an infantry person. Everyone in the Marines who's not an infantry has envy for the ones who are actually our Marines. Even a situation like this, as we see in this scene, they're all wanting to be big and hard real Marines, even though they're not, because a few of them have gone on missions uh, covering their stories. So they've seen a bit of the shit. And that's kind of what they're, you know, basically comparing dick sizes about here now. But yes, they're all pokes. This is the Tet Offensive. This was a real thing in Vietnam. This kind of absolute barbarism is just essentially Hollywood bullshit, but it gave us a funny line, so. How can you shoot women, children? Easy. You just don't lead them so much. <laughs> Ain't war hell. Yes, the colonel here wearing his uh, very shiny rank in the middle of the field is very much bullshit. Uh, the only saving grace here is in the book it kind of explains this guy was a pogue colonel. He was not an actual infantry guy, so he didn't know any better. Uh, if you don't know the uh, story behind this, you know, wearing really shiny things that show you're an officer is basically sniper food. So and you would just be targets for a sniper who wants to get an officer kill. So if you know the story behind this from the book, this actually uh, means something. However, just watching it in the movie it just kind of comes off like bullshit. Yes, Joker does uh, manage to track down Cowboy, and they have the big reunion here. And some people call this bullshit, like how they managed to do that. You know, is it? It's for movie purposes, blah blah blah. Well, of course it is for movie purposes, but military. I can tell you, the military as a whole isn't that large, especially the Marine Corps is very small. A place like Vietnam, it wouldn't have been unheard of for Joker to, you know, know the information of where Cowboy was, and manage to track him down. So yeah, no problem with this actually. 
a uh, bunch of guys just hanging around with a dead body is yeah, that's kind of Hollywood bullshit. They would have disposed of it by now. It's just you know, no one's that inhumane. This is kind of a uh, war as hell. We've turned into barbarians, which part of what this movie's kind of pushing, which is a bit unfair. It's pretty amazing as they go down this line that everyone has a quip just ready to go for the cameras. I uh, I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. I wanted to be the first kid on my block to get a confirmed kill. And that was fucking funny. It's pretty lucky that uh, Animal's gun here never jams. So we just see him just firing it nonstop. Here's a, here we have the climax of the movie. Uh, you know, a woman sniper or a woman just acting uh, for the uh, VC isn't completely unheard of. But I won't call bullshit on it just because it was only used for the scene just for the shock value of it. Like, it wasn't that common. It was a pretty rare occasion. But it kind of adds to the shock value of the whole thing, which kind of is the downfall of the whole second half. A lot of it was just kind of trying to focus on man's inhumanity to man and the barbarism of the whole situation. And this is where the realism that we kind of established in the first part kind of falls apart as we focus on some of the more uh, shocking and, you know, titillating uh, extremes of the war as opposed to more of the realism, which you could probably go see Platoon for that. Uh, and that's going to do it for uh, Military Bullshit and Movies here with the Salty Seaman. Hope you like it. If you did, check out a couple of my other videos I got up here. Uh, you know, f advice for a Navy boot camp, uh, some top 10 military myths. I'll probably have some more of these videos in the future. Um, look, probably go more back into my wheelhouse being the Navy, you know, Navy specific, maybe uh, down Periscope. Some Top Gun at some point sounds pretty good. So if you like what you see, tickle the subscribe button, you know, give me a like and a thumbs up, share the video, give me some comments, and I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.